What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatness, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients to make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Yvonne Le Borgne, and we talk about process literacy and how this relates to collaborative work and how groups can self-facilitate without a facilitator. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, why don't you just scroll down, look into the show notes to download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy the show. Ewen, looking forward to our conversation. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be uh, with you today. Yes, me too. And before we dive into the topic and the further conversation, I always like to hear the story first. Would you tell us when you started calling yourself a facilitator? So, well, actually, I, I didn't call myself a facilitator for a very long time uh, because I never, I was, I was never, I mean, even now I'm working as a freelancer and I do a lot of facilitative work, but, uh, but yeah, it's still only one of the things that I do somehow. So there was a moment when I started uh, really getting in a little bit more into facilitation where I maybe tended to look at myself as a, as a facilitator, but yeah, but it was not for a very, for a very long stretch. And, uh, and I also had an epiphany when uh, talking with Sam Gaynor from community at work when, uh, when, yeah, he really uh, explained to me also how, what his perspective of, uh, of also his work, which is really using facilitation as a, as a skill that, uh, that you can put to use for many different things. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it really resonated with me because also facilitation is often uh, related to meetings in particular. A lot of facilitators are really meeting facilitators. And I think that the, I, yeah, I think, and I wish that the work that I do goes beyond just facilitating meetings and into, yeah, much wider collaboration processes. So mm -hmm. Long answer for your question. Sorry for that. Please don't apologize for long answers because that's what you're here for. And I love this question. I'd like to start with it because maybe most of my guests would say that they don't call themselves facilitators and still the work they do is facilitating. Mm -hmm. And I'm still wondering what it is that we find the label facilitator so restrictive. So maybe it's not sexy enough. I don't know. There's, there was actually a T-shirt that, that was saying like, um, people call me facilitator, but I'm like a wicked problem cracker or something. And it was like a, a really, really cool. I, I could I could look it up and uh, and share it with you. It's really nice. But uh, but yeah, I think it's uh, I think a lot of us are just uh, just doing that among among other things. And uh, and I think I mean for me, it's also now very consciously associated with another idea, which is I I really am pushing a little bit of my work away from the central place of the facilitator. I'm sort of, yeah, I'm really in a, in a, in a space and in a mood to desacralize the function of the central facilitator. And so, yeah, calling myself the facilitator is basically, yeah, it's, I, I want to destroy my stage, kill my darling. I love that. And what do you mean by that? <laughs> so well, what I is the next step after the facilitator? So interestingly, uh, actually, um, I started uh, this morning at uh, three o'clock in the morning because every six to eight weeks, I have a study group cycle with uh, with that same uh, the same group from a community at work in San Francisco. They invite all the people that have been following their multi-stakeholder collaboration uh, course to reflect on multi-stakeholder collaboration. And, and this cycle is around online facilitation. And there was actually this, uh, yeah, this, uh, this question of uh, how do you see the future of your, of your work with these facilitative skills? What is going to be different, et cetera? And I really do think that this is actually one of the things that's, that's pushed even more by this uh, move to online and, and now already and more and more so towards hybrid meetings of distributing the facilitative skill across the entire group of people that is interacting with each other. So that means really elevating the yeah the process, the collaborative literacy of both the leaders or sponsors of a, of a particular event or initiative or whatever, obviously of the people who are more centrally in charge of facilitating interactions, but also all the participants or contributors that are joining a particular gathering. Once everyone starts understanding what it takes to, well, to advance together on a topic 
the all the all the magic of process behind their interactions i think everyone is actually better able uh, individually and as groups to move forward towards uh, healthy and productive solutions so mm -hmm. i think that's that's the direction we're going towards not to say it's easy no if it was easy then it wouldn't need to be facilitated right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and i i do like the vision of groups self-facilitating their problem-solving process and their collaborative work. And I have a few questions about that. One would be about the skill set or mindset that these group members would need in order to make this happen. So how do you balance then group dynamics and different personalities? And also whether you would see that this is an option for any kind of workshop and collaborative work. So how to, if, for instance, sometimes the outside perspective is important to get in, but maybe it isn't. Yeah. So I think, first of all, to answer your question on the whether it's for all types of meetings, I think I think further than the line, yes, I think it's for any type of interactions. And I think also, again, working in online and hybrid environments, there's a lot more potential for asynchronous interactions. I mean, until now, it was, I mean, all face to face is premised on being together in one place. So of course you have to to yeah to base interactions on that. But once you have asynchronous, there's a lot of things you can do even for group decision making that I think is going to progressively transform itself as we go for, further. And uh, sorry, I missed maybe the beginning of your of your question on this. What was the the other part? This The second question. Oh yeah, the skill set and uh, and the attitude. That was that. I think you know, as far as skill set attitudes, uh, I, well, first of all, it's like it, it's it's recognizing what process is. I think that really for me, this is. I mean, my work exists to equip people, organizations, networks with process literacy, language skills, tools, so that they can bring their whole self and they can connect their whole self with others to crack really difficult problems that they wouldn't be able to crack together mm -hmm. and i think so one part of that is really the understanding what is process and how it works etc as part of that there's some specific things such as particularly i think group dynamics uh, i think group decision making is also a really uh, fundamental aspect of that i think it's also recognizing who you are so bringing the self as instruments whether again you're a facilitator you're a leader you're a, a, a contributor of, of other kinds i think it's about uh, understanding this and the attitude i think is primarily i, I would say two it's uh, it's curiosity and empathy which is uh yeah curiosity vis-a-vis -vis the different topics and curiosity vis-a-vis -vis others and and having a, a knack for wanting to to get the perspective of others on a given issue. I think if everyone cultivates that already, even without all the rudiments of facilitation, a group is much better equipped to actually work with each other better. Two things that I would like to unpack. One is the process literacy. And if I understand it correctly, this means understanding that any type of collaborative work is not just a workshop, but it is a process that combines asynchronous work with synchronous work. And I totally agree that, especially now, since we have been forced to work remotely, we came to realize that we don't have to sit in the same room for all the bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. And I think especially, I think that the workshops and meetings we have now, by definition and circumstances, they are much more focused on the content because all the coffee moments and chit chats are kind of taken apart because we don't have this kind of personal space, intimate space with turning to our neighbors. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether we first have to, and maybe these two are combined, whether we have to detach ourselves from the false belief that we have to do everything together in the same room. For instance, like a brainstorming, or you mentioned the example of decision-making. Do we really have to be in the same room? Or maybe it could be healthier to actually give everyone space to think about it, do the brainstorm, put the stickies on a digital white wall, and then come together to discuss. And how does it relate to process literacy? So in order to make this work, what is there to learn? Or what do we get wrong about processes in general that we I have never even thought about the concept of process literacy before you mentioned it? 
Well, I, I think I think for me, I mean, to maybe also crack that nut of what is process literacy. If if you look at um, what people do when they have when they collaborate or when they meet and they have conversations, they focus on the what. That's the content. It's mm-hmm. what are they talking about? What are they doing something with each other about, etc. Everything that is around that, the why do we do it, the how do we do it, the who, when, where. For me, that's process. And so process literacy is just realizing that if you just keep focusing on the what you want to talk about, you're missing out on the conditions for the what. And you're also restricting your senses to it because the what is usually, again, at least in face-to-face and synchronous moments, it's focusing on the on the spoken word. The how, etc., starts involving all your other senses, almost all the way to the to your nose, etc. But certainly your eyes, your eyes see the process, you know, and you sense things that are not spoken. And that is something that, yeah, I think people can really uh, can really see this. So, yeah. But wouldn't this mean, especially when we talk about all the senses, wouldn't this mean that it's even a bigger challenge to do this in an online world and asynchronously? Or is it enough to have our senses in our own four walls? I mean, asynchronously, yeah, just it just brings another set of challenges. So I think uh, I, I think that's why for me, yeah, process literacy is also helpful in in rethinking all of that. The basic opportunity we have now is is actually to keep on rethinking our options and to rethink our processes because we just see that we need to adapt for online and now for hybrid environments and indeed starting to unpack all kinds of ways to do it. So even decision making, indeed, that can be done asynchronously and using platforms and and using visual platforms, using many different things many different tools at the end of the day i think it's 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 again it boils down to that uh, to that mindset and that attitude of of paying attention i mean if you want to have decision making it's not so much getting everyone together at the same time in a room that will make the difference the difference is you need to really make sure that you understand all the perspectives that can influence the way that a group is going towards a particular decision and if you're not paying due diligence to that well at least if you're seeking consensual decision making you're not uh, yeah you're not going to hit the mark Because the trick in that is also that not every context, not every dynamics requires consensual decision making either. And I think for me, this is one of the cruxes of, uh, of, of again, process literacy. If, if leaders, if participants, if facilitators don't understand the type of dynamics that you're in, everyone is like having completely different expectations about their role, about what they're supposed to bring, etc. And I think that creates a lot of problems in the way that uh, people are engaging with each other. So would it then mean... So how I translate it in my for myself is that obviously we start with the why. And then when it comes to process, it's basically a sequence of conversations, alignment and decisions that need to take place in a certain order. And then there might be some if conditions around the way, but this is how I imagine process. And then everyone needs to agree on this process and to understand its logic. Is this what you mean by process literacy? I think process literacy looks at all of this. I mean, again, you know, if 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 uh, I think this is like a, a regular thing with uh, with words and concepts, I see always some value in uh, in having conversations about linguistics and what you mean with things. But if something doesn't resonate with you, do away with it and uh, and find yeah. something else that does work for you. But I, I think to look at your example, I don't think that every interaction is necessarily leads to a decision to be taken either. See, that's mm-hmm. the thing. In one typology, type one meetings are really informative meetings. So someone comes and say, I just passes on information. This is this is what we have decided. This is going to be a new policy. This is this piece of research that we've done, whatever. The only job for everyone else is to understand what is going on there, but not to actually question it or influence it or anything. And at type two, you start having consultative dynamics, then you really pick the brains of people to really sort of influence how the decision makers are going to make a decision about it. And in type three, collaborative, explorative, then you might actually come up with a decision that needs everyone's input to, to really advance to a yeah, sustainable agreement. But even then, it doesn't need to be a decision. It could just be a joint exploration with no one playing any particular role. Not everything has to lead to a decision either, interestingly. But I think we have, you see, because it's a little bit like a facilitation and, and particularly meetings, taking the sort of collaboration aside for, for a bit. Because everyone does it, it's like communication. Everyone thinks that they know it, but they don't. I mean, we don't. We are so poorly equipped. I mean, it's it's incredible that now there's like much more trainings on facilitation, et cetera. But it, it should be like a life skill that is taught from, from, you know, from early age, because it's so essential to be able to work with each other, to listen to each other carefully, to do things together. So I totally agree. 
facilitating as a life skill, which is related, as you said, to listening, to curiosity, which goes far beyond the meeting room. I mean, it happens yeah. at every dinner or breakfast table, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like this this guy on a masterclass of uh, negotiations that uh, reminding us every day we face like, I don't know, 50 or 60 negotiations, you know, like crossing a street is a negotiation, talking about where to have dinner is a negotiation, all of that. And this actually points exactly to the struggle I had previously when you said sometimes we don't need to take decisions and or we are not taking decisions. And I I would dare to challenge that because I think we are taking decisions constantly, whether I say something or I don't say something, whether I listen to the group or I don't listen to the group, who moves forward with what idea. And I think most of the time in our awake lives, we take decisions by not doing anything, which mm. is also a decision. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, yeah, maybe to be more, more detailed, what I meant is like uh, a group doesn't have to take a particular decision towards a particular productive outcome. Mm. We do take, everyone does take decisions about themselves and, 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 and a facilitator and a leader in particular have a particular role to play yeah. in an interaction yeah. about the decisions. Yes, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Which brings us back to um, another conversation <laughs> that we had um, previously a few minutes ago, coming back to the group self-facilitating and whether this model of having everyone facilitating instead of having one with a label facilitate on its forehead mm -hmm. and i wondered to what extent or how you would deal with the risk that some are willing to take more space in a conversation and then guide or pull the conversation or discussion into a direction that might not have been the purpose or where someone has a different idea about that so if you have this distributed power across a group without one who is in charge of guiding. How would you deal with that? Well, I mean, this, this is the thing that um, I think in, in many uh, environments, it, it doesn't really happen that there is no, well, actually, no, it does happen that there's a lot of unfacilitated uh, <laughs> initiatives. <laughs> Unfortunately. And Unfortunately, yeah, exactly. I think right now we're not at a stage where that can really happen in most cases very meaningfully or health, yeah, healthily. Frankly, even if you take like, for instance, a bunch of facilitators themselves <laughs> left on their own devices, it's oh, it's such a mess. I mean, we're, we're actually not pretty good at, at following instructions and at and at, at practicing what we preach when with each other somehow. I mean, I, I've noticed that. I've witnessed that so, several times. Yeah. But uh, but I do like think that. Uh, but there's also a point to uh, the people that take space. I think I think there's there's a lot of ways that. Uh, I mean, I, I used to really uh, early on in my facilitative career or pathway, I tended to look at these people as a problem in the equation. Uh, because yeah, because they're visible, and because I really had very little tolerance for people that monopolize the conversation. And I think you know, I'm, I I work in the Netherlands. I think the Netherlands is the country that has invented because of the the Polder model, consensus based model. You know, if it was yeah. not for that, the country would have gone underwater. So they invented the problem of acute meeting itis. It was really invented here, and I think it gives you a serious life skill opportunity, life skill development opportunity to say no to meetings that suck, and to really pick your your yeah your dynamics in there so so there's something interesting about that but yeah i sort of uh, walked away from that because because these people are actually very important people that are quick to think on their toes and share ideas are the ones that actually inject some energy in any conversation at the beginning and you also need that of course if you just linger with them talking all the time it's a different story altogether but there's all kinds of ways that you can uh, do it and if you have a group that again has that distributed capacity and that was able to organize its on-the-spot decision about how they're progressing in their own conversation, you would have some people that would say, oh, let's take a minute to think for on our own about this, or let's take a moment to, to go in, in small groups, have a conversation and then come back, or I don't know, or let's do a different kind of dynamics or let, let's draw something. You know, like, there's so many ways that you can diffuse the way that people are engaging with a particular piece of content. And I think, yeah, but people don't necessarily see all these options because they need some more process literacy. <laughs> Absolutely. And I um, I like the way how you shifted your mindset about these people who monopolize uh, conversations. And it almost feels like an elastic where if you don't have them at all and everyone is just silent, there's no energy in the room. But then if there's 
someone overstretching it, it might explode and then it takes all the energy out of the conversation. Yeah. And I think the starting with a silent brainstorm and then going into small groups, like in the one to four all structure, is a good way also to not to provide the stage for these people to share mm -hmm. too much, because at least if they're taking the space, it's only in a small group and only one or two people suffer, not everyone. Yeah. So what is your favorite exercise to know? In general? Yes, what, please. What to do with that? Well, in general, I don't really have like, a, because I, I sort of come across different things at different times and get, uh, yeah, get interested to to playing them out, even though, I mean, and this is one I've, I've, I've blogged recently about what I see as my 10 commandments of, uh, of facilitation. I think it's really, Did it's really nice. Did you publish really them? Uh -huh. Did you yeah, yeah, I published them. them. Yeah. Oh, I will put the link in the show notes. Sure. Yeah. And one of them is actually to not sort of uh, fall in love with your own needs and your own uh, your, your own hobby horses. You know, it's very easy for a facilitator to decide, oh, I'm going to do this because I really want to to find out. And look, we actually do need a space to to sort of do safe fill practicing, etc. But not in a big workshop. And I mean, not not in a public thing. You, you have other opportunities to try it out but you shouldn't be falling in love with your own uh, tactics but so yeah that said so i do have phases when i'm sort of exploring different things but there's one there's a few things that i keep on using on a regular basis but there's one that i i, I like particularly and it's uh, and it comes from the liberating structures repertoire and it's called troika consulting mm -hmm. whereby you know it's a little bit like uh, peer assist if that rings a bell or intervision it's called in uh, in holland but it, it works with three people and uh, in turn, everyone is like the client explaining an issue and the other two consultants clarifying first. And then the client turns their back or shuts their screen if it's online and listens to the conversation of the, the two consultants that are actually talking to one another, not to the client. Yeah. And I find this so great at so many levels because A, it's super simple, super easy to set up. Everyone is playing the role. So there is no, you know, like one person that is just a client and everyone plays everything. You actually get to really listen deeply because you're, you're forced to. There is no other option. You actually get to hear about practical solutions for your problems, but also to other problems. So it's actually really bringing a lot of solutions. And on top of it, because of all the dynamics, it reinforces the trust and the bonding and the relationship between people. So such a simple thing for me that also I think I'm particularly um, inclined to using it because it's a feedback mechanism. And I think feedback Feedback is a magical thing, and it's a it's a superpower that everyone can use, and we just don't use it enough. So um, whenever we can, yeah. Yeah, I love Troika Consulting, plus one on everything you just said. And yes, feedback is magic. And feedback, I think it's similar to what you mentioned about conversations, that everyone expects us to do it or meetings. It's just what we do, but nobody told us how to do it. I mean, there are now more and more courses and literature about feedback. And I think the best book that I ever read about it has the awful name, Thanks for the Feedback. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's my Bible also. Yes. Yes. And for me, the big eye opener was that actually when we say feedback, we are not specific enough whether we mean evaluation, whether we mean coaching, or whether we mean praise. Supportive. Yeah, yeah. And that usually we deliver something that we have in mind. Again, we're in love with our own thoughts yeah. and forget what the other person actually wants. Or needs. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And if we give feedback, because I mean, in most cases, people don't give any feedback whatsoever. And if they do give feedback without even realizing it's negative feedback, let alone, you know, constructive feedback. So, uh, <laughs> or actionable feedback. Yeah. yeah. A feedback that does not involve a clearly actionable item is just rambling. It's not yeah. feedback. And so yeah. we give it the labor feedback. Yeah. And I think to come back to the Troika consulting, what I think is the small detail that makes all the difference is, as you explained, that the two consultants speak about yeah. the client and not to the client. Yeah. So it's basically, it's not feedback. You should do this. Yeah. But it's, oh, yeah, this person is sharing that. So I think, so they make it about themselves. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think also it forces you not only as a, as a client to listen, but also to not intervene and sort of defend yourself because that's that's the natural inclination. It's like, oops, no. I mean, yeah. honor, honor this. This is like receiving feedback uh, non-defensively. It's, yeah. uh, it's really great. Yeah, it's like a gift. When I do it online, I ask uh, the clients to mute themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I even, yeah. I, yeah. Exactly. 
to really indulge <laughs> and feel into themselves. Yeah. And you you mentioned liberating structures, and I signed up for your immersion workshop. I'm very Yay. much looking forward to that. Finally, it took me years. And it's time to um, get into the student seat again. What is the relation between liberating structures and process literacy? So, well, I think I think there's a, there's a lot because I think it's it's simplifying process. Liberating structures for me is a, it's it's a whole repertoire that I'm sort of marveling at because uh, it's a little bit like the, the Dutch national identity. You know, it's like if you spend three months here or six months or one year, you're going to have a different opinion about what is going on in the country. You just like it's just. <laughs> So many layers to that onion that you need to peel off. And it's the same with liberating structures. It really looks at first for most people like, oh, it's just like a nice repertoire of some structures, some some exercises I've seen somewhere else, somehow repackaged, whatever, not done in a neat way. There's so much more to it than meets the eye. So, so much more. There's a whole layer of language that is actually at first actually even off-putting. I mean, to, to the extent that I... I even felt at the beginning that it, it really felt to me like it was a bit of a cult. People that were in the liberating structures uh, cult, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's OK. It's like Apple fans like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's fine, but I, I don't need to be part of your cult, you know. But actually, the language itself has got a lot of uh, playfulness about it and also a lot of interesting invitations to look at things differently. So there's a lot of mirrors of lenses in liberating structures. There's a lot of feedback loops and mirror effects of how the structures and the language of the structures is reflecting on each other in many different ways. I'll come back probably also to how the structures are, are combinable, but that's, that is also very noticeable there. But the point is, um, with liberating structures, you go deep fast. That's the thing. It looks like something innocuous, something like, ah, oh, yeah, simple, business as usual, whatever. And you start witnessing, first of all, what it does to interactions without, again, a facilitator, a central stage that is saying, oh, you know, I'm the one to bring you the magical process, whatever. Everyone is involved in that. But yeah, you start seeing what it does. And you also start seeing how there's always deeper implications. And so some things that look really harmless, I'm thinking about another liberating structure called Triz, which starts really playfully by asking people to imagine a complete nightmare scenario of what is uh, of what is going on. And then every Everyone is like playful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's imagine, you know, we do this and that, etc. And the second step is, okay, now looking at the list of terrible behaviors, are there any of, of them that possibly you're remotely guilty of here and there? And then it's like, uh-huh, uh, yeah, actually, yeah, there's yeah, there's a bit of this and a bit of that, etc. I think it's such an eye-opener. It's so, and yeah, so potent, yeah. so little. So the connection with process literacy is that because it is so simple, because it doesn't actually require a long experience as facilitator, it, it is process literacy in a box. It, it brings anyone, any group, any, any person in a capacity to quickly change their interactions and to start paying attention to the distribution, to the timing, to a lot of things that are part of process literacy. And I think that's really powerful. Process literacy in a box. I love that. Yeah. Because when I think of literacy, obviously, it's learning a language. And you mentioned that the language around the liberating structures is something, but each structure is also like a part of a language or a letter in the alphabet yeah. um, that you can combine into strings. They follow a grammar. They have like uh, five components that are always there in each of the structures. And that's the grammar of liberating structures. But then, yeah, you can actually form your, your sentences stringing structures, stretching structures, because there's really an invitation to actually also imagine, reinvent how some of the structures are, are done. There's also a very, very active uh, sub-movement within the liberating structures community, which is not a very homogeneous community worldwide anyway. It's lots of different people doing lots of different things, but that are basically really busy with uh, with developing new structures. And then there's the, the, the nesting. Like, for instance, you bring a, a bigger structure that takes, say, 30 to 60 to 90 minutes or two hours, whatever. And inside that, even inside one structure, you can actually bring another structure. One of the things that we did in one of the immersion workshops, for instance, was eco-cycle planning, which is another structure that I really love for the, the, the lens that it brings on on how you look at your activities or relationships. And inside that, we nested some uh, some spiral journal, which is some way to reflect for yourself about certain things. And the, the combination of that, you just start seeing like, wow. So maybe one of the other powers, and I don't want this to be just about liberating structures really, but it, but it is quite remarkable that it's a repertoire that keeps on calling more of itself onto it. And that's the thing that is both 
amazing and also a bit daunting and a bit uh, concerning for me that, you know, I feel like the more I invest my time and space in liberating structures, the more I need to do that because there's just so many options within just that repertoire to just reshape everything, all kinds of interactions. There's things it doesn't do well, but in general, there's there's almost endless possibilities. So, Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of the Dunning-Kruger effect, that if you just know a little bit, you tend to over to become overconfident. Ah, I figured that out, liberating structures, just common sense. And if you know how to facilitate, even not, you can use it. And then as you described, if you dive into it, you realize, actually, I have no clue. And there's so much more. One quick aspect also that is a, a little bit of an aside, but I think one of the one also of the other powers, and that's maybe it's, it's resonating with me because I, I come from the, the world of knowledge management, learning, you know, that's that's how I got into facilitative work is that it is an open source movement. So basically, the inventors, the founders have said from the start, make it your own. You can make money out of it. You just need to, to pay respect, pay tribute where it's due. But otherwise, make it your own. Just play with it. And I think that is also a real strength compared to a lot of facilitative practices and consultancies that are really protecting with copyrights, et cetera, their, their, yeah, their work. I understand where they're coming from, but I think that's one of the big powers of liberating structures and why it's sort of spreading out so so fast. It, I call it the silent revolution sometimes, liberating structures, because of that. Nice. Yes, and silent revolution maybe also because it it really it's applicable. I think when we boil it down, and correct me if I'm wrong, because as I said, I haven't done my immersion workshop yet, <laughs> but from what I understand, it relies on a few basic principles as One, there are different personalities, so it's important to respect those who need thinking time. So start with a silent brainstorm first. Second, we cannot have meaningful conversations in larger groups, and a larger group starts beyond four people. <laughs> so break it down. And it takes time to, to grasp a big complex thing, so make it easy and start with the, the easiest, the quick win to tackle first. The one aha moment and then take it from there because then you already have the energy. Yeah, I've just uh, just displayed behind uh, all the different uh, principles because I think it, it, yeah, I mean, again, a lot of things like, duh, you know, it makes sense when you see it as like retrospective coherence. Once you know something, all of a sudden it makes perfect sense. But uh, but to actually come up with that simplicity, yeah, it's uh, it's quite difficult. Greetings, listeners. Dancing with Markers has launched a new online self-paced course on visuals designed with facilitators in mind. Stop making boring, meaningless slide decks and start bringing visuals into your meetings in a fun, purposeful, and creative way that will have a real impact on improving the outcomes of your meeting. Visuals are central to facilitating engaging meetings, but so many facilitators and trainers lack a strong design muscle to create fun and purposeful flip charts, slides, and visual templates. For the facilitator who wants to incorporate better visuals into your meetings, this course is designed to transform you into a confident visual facilitator. Find the link to purchase in the show notes with a special 10% off coupon just for Workshops Work listeners. Now, back to the show. And I would be curious, with all the experience that you have, and I guess you came uh, across many people who tried liberating structures and maybe have questions, Where can it go wrong? So what would be your advice to an inexperienced facilitator, maybe just a team leader who buys the Liberating Structure book or goes on the website and thinks, oh, I'm going to do that and it will be the silent revolution now. Everything will be fine. What can go wrong? So there's a few things that uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. One is I think Liberating Structures are, are not good at certain things. And then, for instance, achieving consensual decision making is not one of the strong suits to Liberating Structures. And that's, that's for me, that's on the other hand, the holy grail of facilitative work. That's really why facilitators or maybe your facilitative skills are, are, are required in the first place. But it does, it does very well everything else around that. But so if you try to, to, to stretch them to do that, I think yeah, I mean, you, you can get there, but it's, it's really, it's, it's not very graceful. Well, it's an interesting dance. It's on the one hand, to be too rigid in applying the, the structures, exactly like textbook. For instance, if you mm. look at what's on the website or in the book, it's quite a different story to the practice of some people that have been using it for a while. And I think that's that's because, yeah, we keep on refining it, etc. 
at the same time, freeing yourself entirely from the timings and from some of the, the principles of each of the structures also doesn't help because there is something, there's one of the structures in liberating structures is really important to know. It's called wicked questions. And that's that, that paradoxical thinking of not thinking either or, but and, and. So liberating structures in itself is a wicked question. How can we be wanting to have liberating interactions and at the same time wanting structure to make it happen? The premise of liberating structures is that a tiny bit of structure is going to liberate interactions. If you have no structure whatsoever, you end up in, in entropy with, again, the highest paid person opinion that is dominating the, the place, etc. With too much structure, like the, the, the status report, the presentation, you basically, you, you, yeah, you calcify the, the, the interactions also. So it's like a fine balance to find there. But I think those can also go wrong. And I would say the final thing, it's not related to liberating structures, but what I do notice some former graduates of immersion workshops having some difficulties with is just to stand their ground, to just having like enough confidence to say, well, let's give it a try. And, and if they encounter a little bit of resistance for the language or different reasons, then it can also go wrong. But yeah, that's yeah. just a, a life quest, I think, also. <laughs> Very <laughs> true. Confidence. Very true. Two things come to my mind. One is the concept that in order to think out of the box, we first have to define the box. Yeah, <laughs> so we exactly. do need the restrictions um, to think big. And the second is, yeah, standing the ground. And I think a big risk is, or an easy trap is, ah, let's give a few minutes more. Let's give them a few minutes yeah. more. And yeah. this is where it goes wrong because the having only four minutes or five minutes to discuss, you have enough time to go sufficiently deep without getting lost in the details. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's indeed very tempting for people to to want to find the space that they're used to. And I mean, I I, I do realize the pacing is a is a particularly difficult thing. It's a, it's a challenging thing for many 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 folks. But uh, and yeah, we, we'll explore that in the immersion workshop. There's there's some reasons why, and, and indeed you're you're sort of hinting at some of them here. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, and I wonder to what extent it's the constant doubt as a facilitator. You stand there, you have to, you have the responsibility for the group, for the process. And then somehow, oh, might they need some more time? Yeah. You have to give them time. And then it's this urge to be liked or to be in service, which is actually a false friend. It's like parents who say yes all the time, although yeah. children appreciate the no. I think I think it's at the junction of that. I, I think it's really well worded what you're what you're saying about uh, yeah, wanting to please people and not to be seen as you know the the policeman etc. I mean, indeed, for for instance, by myself, time management is the one thing that I I really really hate about uh, facilitation. I, in fact, in fact, thanks to Sam Gainer and, and his gang, I've, I've learned to uh, to distribute that responsibility also with my with my person in charge, and that's such a a liberating thing. Also, anyway, share with us. So what's no now I need to yeah, know. I'll, I'll, well, okay. Shall I, shall I mention that and then uh, and then coming back to the um, to the the pleasing and the the confusion because I think that's really an interesting uh, an interesting one. Yeah. So basically, I mean, if uh, what what I've uh, learned through uh, through Sam is involve your your person in charge, whoever that is. You know, the person could be the sponsor, but it could also be for a particular segment of an interaction, a person that has been designed as appointed as the as the person in charge, and rather than, than you. Calling the shot, saying like, oh, we're just going to cut short, etc. No, actually, especially if you intervene as an external uh, facilitator in this case, you basically lay the responsibility with the leader, with the person in charge to, you can just mention, look, I'm seeing that we're not going to have the time to reach the point we wanted to reach in the time given. What do you want to do? Do you want to continue this conversation or do you want to, to cut it short? And you leave that responsibility to them because it is their meeting. It is not yours, you know, and, uh, and they have, especially if you're not a content matter specialist in that particular subject, you're maybe less equipped to find out whether the conversation has gotten exactly where it could be whereas the yeah the person in charge really brings that in and so and it also means you know like otherwise they're very happy to let you do everything but actually it's really great to involve again it's process literacy it's like hey this is what it entails another yes. opportunity yes so the other thing that you were saying about uh yeah so i think it's um how did you frame it it's like yeah you, you're sometimes you don't want to to cut people short because of the because you don't want to to displease others etc and I think that does happen. The other thing is it's sometimes uh, it's also about cultivating, uh, well, maybe a concept we're going to unravel a little bit together, 
called confusiasm. Mm. It's it's cultivating the the confusion of uh, of people and confusion not so much for the sake of confusion. It's like you know to fail fair. You don't your intention is not to fail, but it's like to embrace failure to do something positive out of it. Same thing with confusion. Confusion means that you're learning. So confusiasm is the enthusiasm for confusion because that means, hey, there is something happening and I want to keep on being confused because that means I'm sort of educating my questions, etc. And I think part of that means that everyone in interactions should be somehow uh, a little bit easier and a little bit less uncomfortable with quick and dirty, with not perfect solutions, with safe fail. Fading forward is one of the key principles of liberating structures and for a very good reason. We need that. And in many, many workplaces, we're not encouraged. We need to have like the perfect plan, the perfect publication, the perfect decision. Well, you know, I mean, what's it called? Agile and Scrum, they're not going that way for a very good reason. Exactly. And I think it's a wicked uh, question as well, where um, corporates don't allow for failure and still they have a learning department. So if you assume that everyone knows that nobody needs to learn, it's only when you assume that uh, there's something you are missing, then you need to learn. And then, of course, you're going to fail because it is a process. And what I like about this Confucianism, I love the concept. Confuciasm. Otherwise, it's a, it becomes Conf a religion Con almost. Confuciasm. Yeah, yeah, it's a yasm too much. Confuciasm. <laughs> Confuci Confuciasm. Yeah. Yes, it's it sounds like the constant buildup of new synapses between neurons. So if you are not only if you're confused, you realize that there is a missing link. So you you see that there are different pieces of information in your brain, but they're not connected yet. And that's why you're confused. Yeah. And then the process of building these bridges and combining these neurons is yeah a powerful one thank you for bringing that up and it's it's actually it's got a sort of a, a pending image or the, the the nemesis of of uh, of being confusiastic is you know the expert that has the the sort of the yeah the achieved expert i'm an expert so you know i have reached that level where i don't need to question my content it, it's got a relation with uh, with content and process here i think because that's that's one of the things that we we sort of explored in in our in our pre-chat but uh I think, yeah, how to encourage people to be enthusiastic and to not focus only on the content. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's indeed to, to to cultivate that appreciation for the fact that we are all contributing. I mean, I think it's safe to to expect everyone to see that change is the only constant now, you know, it's like, I mean, certainly the past. Not only now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so this is what's going on. So how can you say, no, I don't need to learn. So no, we do need to learn. Yeah. And one way to sort of not rest on our laurels is to assume that we are not expert, that we keep on learning. And I think if you are a process specialist, by definition, it's so complex, it's so social that you keep on, on learning and you keep on having to be open. But in a subject matter, in a content expertise, you can really go down. And at some point, indeed, you feel like I've actually reached a thing, even though I well, assume well, that real well. scientists are still questioning, they still know that they don't know. The Don't more they, they know, the more they know that they don't know. Yeah, exactly. And I, um, in a previous podcast recording with uh, Dov Zahl, he said, there's only one thing that everyone is for sure the world expert in. And people should only talk about the one thing that they are world expert in. And that's ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And so we can speak as much as you want about the truth, which is ourselves, because all the rest, we actually have no clue. Maybe some have more clues than the other, but when it most probably not even. And when we look at astrophysics or quantum mechanics, we yeah. realize that actually there's even the most brightest people on earth have no clue. Yeah. I mean it's it's yeah, I mean to talk about a very personal example about this, I'm I'm actually really uh, I'm flabbergasted that uh, epilepsy is uh, is is one of the is a condition that one of my sons has. And it touches, um, it's estimated around 3% of the world population. And it's really like a condition that everyone has heard of in their life, if not witnessed it somehow. And yet, I mean, our medicine has no idea where it comes from and how to really deal with it. For instance, how to, yeah, some some uh, applications like ketogenic uh, diets can uh, can really make a, a difference in, in the way that uh, that the body processes and deals with epilepsy so it's yeah we really don't know very much about no. our world around even ourselves <laughs> i'd wager we actually don't know very much about ourselves either to be honest but 
<laughs> this is very true. Yeah. yeah, and maybe these are the kind of, thank you for sharing your story. And maybe it's by being confronted to these difficult revelations that even for something so important that is so close to us, there is no answer out there. And then how to how to deal with this disc and this is a real discomfort. Yeah. Um, how to deal with it? Yeah. 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 No. So I think I mean uh, for me this is also I think it's it's part of um, you know one of the key lessons. Uh, well, uh, two lessons in, of life for me. I don't know if this is going to be recorded by the way. <laughs> it's really going a little bit outside, but one is everything is love. That's really that's like it's really the absolute truth. It's like if there's one truth that I want to live in my in my life, it's that one. And the other one is to really, as, as you progress in life, to let go of things more and more and more. And part of letting go is about letting go of, of that certainty, of that security of things. It's really, yeah, it's really embracing that confusion because it's also embracing questions instead of answers because questions make you progress. Answers are just like, yeah, they're, they're just going to give you a state of the art at some point but it's not i mean science is only true until it's proven wrong the next time around and yes. even having having worked in scientific world in the scientific world for the past 10 years or so i'm sometimes surprised that some scientists have completely forgotten that at the bottom of science should be that questioning not the we have found a solution you know it's uh yeah it's interesting yeah, and that's i think that we by the environment that we face by the space in which we live and the incentives that we are faced to, it does shape our behavior and how we communicate. So I think in a world where you have a higher competition amongst scientists with having all the A journal publications and having not enough tender positions whatsoever, yes, you have to at least show this overconfidence, yeah. which is not useful and which then makes them forget over time what science is actually about. And I think the same is true for the space we give to our collaborative work or group conversations. If we define the space as being something competitive where we have to find answers and to have to prove our point because there are limited resources and there is only limited way to move up the ladder, then of course we'll get these hard conversations that lack any empathy and curiosity yeah well at least that can also be a good thing huh, to uh, to have i mean i'm not sure that actually all the hard conversations necessarily lack empathy either but yeah i mean it's and it's and it's again and helpful this is this is again something that i've learned with the community at work crew because i mean yeah next deliberating structures as you understand this is like it's it's a major source of influence and it really came quite late in my in my facilitators uh facilitative pathway but I think, yeah, appreciating the the, the value of uh, of again confusion among the members of a group, of uh, of frustration with each other, of the grown zone is just like it's so so important. And I I used to really feel ill at ease with that, you know, with uh, with with people sort of starting to attack each other, etc. Once you you actually really understand the value that it can bring, the value of conflict, it 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 can be a, a, a majorly generative force in the room or in the you know, on the screen or whatever. So um, yeah, I don't shy away from it uh, quite as much. It's uh, usually it's an indication that there is something very interesting there that is maybe going to go beyond the cliches of the business as usual, you know. So an opportunity to go beyond. True. And usually if we have strong emotional reactions, it means that there is either a blind spot or maybe something that we don't want to admit or see. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even to talk back about the, the example of the people that are taking too much space in a conversation or like, for instance, one of the typical patterns that I think many of us have, uh, have come across is someone that just keeps on, on, you know, coming back to the same point. And at first you could be like, oh, there he is again, like uh, rambling on about the same thing. But if you don't actually invite these people to really express themselves, they're going to keep on rambling. So it's like, and I think that's where, again, the point with process literacy, if the, the entire group starts having developing that, that empathy and develops that process vision and, and their skills for listening and for paying attention and for inviting other voices, they actually, they, they create conditions for these people to express themselves and to let go of these ideas and to move on to something else. And, and that's something that I see, for instance, in this study group, because it's it's full of people that have cultivated very strong group facilitation skills. There is natural support for each other and, and natural 
warmth and empathy and an, an invitation for voicing anything that is on our heart or in our mind, no matter how annoyingly people communicate it. And I think that's that's beautiful without the intervention of the, the person facilitating that particular segment. Yes, and I was just, I made the same connection back to our earlier conversation about to what extent is it really relevant to have one facilitator? And I think if I put together all the pieces that you have mentioned throughout our conversation of also distributing tasks to other participants. So once you start distributing these tasks, okay, today you're in charge of the timekeeping and you're in charge to make sure that the conversation is still directed towards the purpose and that we are still talking about the how and not getting lost in the what. Then, and you have mastered or at least are working on these skills of self awareness, curiosity, listening, respect. Then, basically, the role of the one facilitator can dissolve. Exactly, progressively. And it's yeah. just so much more worth it. I'll, I'll tell you another personal anecdote, which is <laughs> part of my wedding with, with my now future ex wife is, uh, was, was uh, facilitated. There was a segment where we wanted our different sort of language communities to mingle, etc. And also, we actually we uh, we in, involved them in the preparation of the, the the wedding because it was like you know in a very very uh, informal setting where we had it in, in a sort of a countryside farm renovated farm where where my uh, my in laws have a house and it was so great. So the, the day before and also I mean to undo but particularly to prepare, lots of people played a role. And the thing that happens is once they start playing even a, a minor role. They're invested emotionally at such a different level in that wedding. And I think it was like really a love fest because of that reason. Same thing in a room. You involve people in, in all kinds of things. They, they start finding it much more interesting. I simply love that example. I mean, co-creating a wedding and it is the IKEA effect. We get attached to something that we build ourselves. And then by definition, your wedding will become meaningful. Yeah. I think this is a topic that Lily Gro on her podcast would be very curious about mm. let me make this connection yeah no so um so yeah i think i think uh so that's why for me you know how, how to cultivate processes you see even even if i mean of course ideally you'd get everyone to sort of get trained coach uh practice together etc on 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 using facilitative skills and on on at some point teaching or, or introducing some some key concepts such as types of meetings group dynamics group decision making all of that but even if you can't do that for me, it's like because we focus on the what we focus with our ears on what is being said. It's like if you start making the, the process scaffolding visible for everyone, it, it, it creates aha moments. And, and it, it takes as little as, for instance, telling people, look, when you start a, a question and answer session, if you start asking a woman to come up with a first contribution, that it's much more likely that more women are going to feel invited to, uh, because otherwise, you know, it's like Maggie Thatcher used to say, if you want something, uh, something said, ask a man. If you want something done, ask a woman. <laughs> it's, it's the one sensible thing that she, that she said at least. But so any, in any, in any case, it's that, or it's like, for instance, I, I sometimes had like, um, uh, teaching to people how to not eat the microphone on um, face to face, but also not have like, you know, what is so eat the microphone is for me, the hard rock stance or death metal stance. Rah, rah, but then you have like also the reggae stance, like so relaxed, you know, I mean, I, no one can hear me anymore. <laughs> like, so all these little things, it just like, it, it's, it starts yeah, getting people to think, hey, there is something else to just the conversation we're having. There's something around it that I start seeing. And I think once, once that aha moment, I've seen some people like talking about scientists that were so touched by the power of process that they decided to actually completely change careers and move into sort of facilitative uh, kind of work. So Fast. incredible. Absolutely. I think also because next to that, we talk about process, but the other big, big thing that is part of that process literacy that facilitators cultivate is relationships. It really is mm -hmm. such a human field. It's it's getting people to connect. And, and for me, this is one of the reasons why 10, 12, 15 years into, into this, I, I still love it because uh, I, I get to know about different topics, but particularly seeing that aha moment of people connecting, collaborating, seeing the point of sticking their head out of the sand and connecting with others. I, wow, it's, 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 it's magic yeah. in front of my eyes. And there's always something to learn. And yeah. every time it's different because of the group dynamics. Yeah. In your experience, what makes a workshop fail? 
Well, I think it's, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's obviously it's a lack of process literacy, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, yeah, what does it mean is I think it's, uh, it's, it's some laziness. It's uh, really, it is laziness. You know, a lot of people just uh, call up meeting or organize meetings and they really haven't been giving much thought about it. You know, it's like there's a cartoon that goes, uh, don't know what to do, getting bored at work call up a meeting and and i think there's a bit of that that happens that uh that sometimes people just yeah they 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 have a vague idea of something that they might want to do but if if they really sort of scratch behind the surface they're going to find out that maybe a meeting is not required because i love collaboration and i encourage people to collaborate whenever it makes sense but i don't encourage everyone to collaborate all the time everywhere with everyone it really is very pricey and difficult and exhausting at times and so it's also something that people need to pay attention to so i think yeah, it's it's laziness in uh, in in paying attention to the why, in thinking about uh, exactly what the outcomes are going to be, in exactly thinking what kind of yeah what kind of dynamics you're you're going to be uh, you're going to be needing. So of course, next to that uh, also come yeah again the same principles of how does group dynamics work, how do you come to a decision, etc. I think it's it's also sometimes emotional and, and ethical laziness. So sometimes you're just not paying attention to the people that should really be there and how they're going to be involved and how you're going to in involve them emotionally also or respect their emotions and their feelings about it there's a lot of things that can really go wrong because of that and then yeah i think i think these for me would be the the the, the bigger things yeah and i like the concept of emotional laziness and i think it's also relates to the participants or contributors as nadia said in the workshop the emotional laziness related to what you observed is how to embrace those who trigger strong emotions in us, because it is difficult. And I think especially when we are hungry or when we are tired or when it comes to the end or we have something different in mind, we are emotionally lazy for good reasons. Yeah. But then it makes it difficult to actually embrace this learning and growth opportunity. Yeah. Mm. And uh, but but I mean still and as you know as I'm sure it's been probably a standard response to that question I think I think that by far I mean it really is the the lack of why the lack of uh, questioning why you know it's yeah. like they, they, this is again it's celebrating structures nine whys if you start asking yourself the, the nine whys of anything you start seeing much more than you originally thought and and I think we just it, it's a normal human being uh, tendency to just settle for the, the minimal effort you know so um, yeah but, as soon yeah. as it gets to the identity of our belief system, it's we tend to avoid that. Mm. Our brain is not made for self-questioning. It's made for survival. So yeah. why would we make it difficult? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, why, why bother really? Yeah. So I think that's that. Yeah. But um, but yeah, many, many other things can happen. Eh? Um, yeah. I cannot believe that we're already talking for an hour. Yeah, I was just lo also looking. It's like, yeah, we're beyond 12 indeed. Yeah. yeah. If someone fell asleep after minute two, just woke up and doesn't have time to listen to the entire conversation, what would you like them to walk away with? I think don't uh, don't believe in the fact that you trust or you need to trust one facilitator. Cultivate facilitative skills and and spread them around because we can all benefit from those in our interactions, in our life, in our work, in ourselves, in, in everything we do. And it's really something, it's a blossoming for the taking, and we should all contribute to planting the seeds of that, uh, of that what's it called? Uh, yeah, anyway, that, uh, that tree garden, <laughs> Le Verger. And I Le had Verger. Uh, the French name in, uh, in mind. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for your enthusiasm, for sharing, for your experience. Really enjoyed the conversation and send me the link to your 10 commandments. I will put them in the show notes and to your immersion workshop, of course. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll send you that. Well, thank you very much, uh, Miriam. I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's been, uh, it's been super nice to have uh, this yeah, very nice and organic conversation. And I look forward to, well, more episodes anyway of your podcast, because I think it's a great initiative which you have. Thank you. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.